What is going on everyone? My name is Benjamin Nowak and today's video is focused on largemouth bass fishing during the post spawn and early summer months. And in my opinion, this is one of the most difficult times to go out and consistently catch fish. So I'm going to share with you guys my offshore pattern to catch largemouth as they transition from the spawn to the post spawn into their early summer patterns so you guys can have success when you go out in your home body's water. For me, there are three main keys to this pattern, but the first thing you have to understand is what the post spawn really means. What time of year is the post spawn or early summer? And how do I identify where these fish are gonna be transitioning to so I can have success when they get out on the water? Now, the biggest thing you have to understand is when do I consider post spawn? What water temps am I looking for? And a lot of times, large mouth are gonna spawn in that low 60 degree range, 60 to 63 degrees. And by the time that water hits about 70 degrees, you're gonna have most of your fish off of bed, moving back out towards their summertime haunts. So 70 to 75 or upper 70 degree range is what I'm gonna be looking for in considering the post spawn or early summer temperatures. A lot of times this is characterized by fish kind of being in multiple different stages along their paths out towards the summertime haunts. One of the coolest things though about the post spawn is that these fish are gonna to start to group up and get in small pods around specific offshore pieces of cover or structure. And so that's what I'm gonna to emphasize today is how to find these offshore areas where you guys can go and pound on a lot of fish. Now it's not easy, it takes a lot of time, but when you make it happen, when you start to put the pieces together, you can go out and have a phenomenal day out there on the water. What these fish are doing is after they get done spawning, they're going to start moving out towards their summer areas, the summer deeper water. And the reason that fish go deep during the summertime is multiple reasons. Number one is that water stays more stable from weather condition changes. It stays cooler and there's more oxygen as well as awesome feeding opportunities on bait fish, crawdads, and a variety of different forage types that live out in deeper water so these fish can feed up very easily with those warmer water temperatures. Another really cool thing about the early summertime pattern is you can intersect these fish when they're in pods and they're willing to eat. They've not been pressured a ton off of the beds and so a lot of times if you find those pods of fish you can catch multiple fish out of the same area on the same bait and really put together a really cool limit. So here's how I find the highway that these fish are traveling as they move out of those spawning flats. And number one is find the deepest water access nearby their spawning flats. A lot of times once these fish get done, the first thing they're gonna do is try to fall into that deeper water. And deeper is super relative. If these fish are spawning up in two, three foot of water, deep water could be a four or five foot depression in the bottom. And a lot of times these fish are gonna to start to move towards that deeper water because they have more opportunities to roam and get away from boats or other traffic that's on the water. And so those deeper water access points, those ditches, those creeks, those feeders, those glacial drop-offs are where these fish are gonna really push to first off of the spawning flats. So the first key to identifying the highway is find deep water access nearby their spawning flats that has a path out towards deeper water. The next key to finding early summer bass is finding some sort of cover on these highways out towards deeper water. And this is point number two find cover on the highway that these fish can stop on, rest on, and group up on to feed on bait fish. They're looking to rest, they're looking to get fat before they move out to the summertime holes. So by finding these areas where there's some piece of offshore cover or different bottom composition is gonna be key to catching bass. What I'm fishing a lot up here in the north, and you guys saw this in that video with Alex, was I was flipping outside grass lines where these fish were congregating and sitting before they started to move out into the summer 20 foot holes and start to feed up and group up out there. This could also mean wood, it could mean rock piles. It's just something different on the bottom that provides these fish an ambush point. So you have shallow water, deep water access with a piece of isolated cover on it and that's a lot of times where these fish are gonna hang out. Another key thing to think about is contour changes on the highway towards the deeper water. This is a big key, especially on glacial style lakes up north, is finding small contour changes where there's a slight turn, a slight flatter area which moves up into the flat. You're just looking for something different that's gonna hold these fish in that area. A lot of these glacial style lakes don't have a ton of features on them, so finding small contour changes, small turns, a little bit flatter areas, can be a really big key to finding and catching these fish. So what you're gonna be focusing on here is finding good grass, finding the greenest, cleanest, best grass you can find, finding rock piles or isolated pieces of cover down there on the bottom, whether it's a log, a stump, a rock, whatever it is, finding a good piece of cover down there on this depth change, or finding a bottom composition change where it goes from sand to mud, sand to rock, whatever it is down there on the bottom that's going to attract zebra mussels and 
other sorts of life and bait fish that these bass can sit on, ambush, before they move it out to that deeper water area. And my number three key factor is finding bait fish and finding food for these fish to feed on. I want to toss you guys a quick clip from my live scope unit where I'm finding these giant pods of bait fish that these bass are basically corralling in these small contour changes and feeding on before they move to deeper water. So for me, this is the key. This is all bait fish. And what these fish are doing is they're taking this big flatter section and they're using it to corral bait up against the flat. And so these bass are gonna sit on the outside edge, like the deeper edge of it, and they're gonna push the bait this way. So you'll see them suspended up, or if you have some grass over here, you'll see the bass suspended in the grass. And that's how you're able to catch these fish, especially on a jig so good. You could probably catch them just as good on a wacky rig or a Nico rig or something a little bit slower, lighter line. But when they're eating a jig like they are today, it's just kind of hard for me. But look at the map. You have a flatter section, which this is pretty flat on this lake when you take a, a picture overall of the, of the lake itself. And I'm looking for bait fish. And then I'm looking for some sort of grass or something to hold the bass outside of them because that's where they're going to be hanging out and sitting. But that's really been the key today. Find the bait fish, find some grass or find some sort of cover out in that water where those bass can hang out. And that's been really the deal. So having those three ingredients, deep water access, pieces of cover or structure changes, and bait fish are the three keys for me to find post-spawn largemouth bass. Finding the best deep water access off of spawning bays, finding isolated pieces of cover or small contour structure changes down there on the bottom, and finding bait fish are gonna hold fish and group fish up as they start to move back out towards deeper water. Now one of the benefits of living up here in the north is we have a ton of different bodies of water that this works on. Whether you're fishing reservoirs with a lot of creeks and creek arms and you're fishing small ditches that lead their way out, whether you're fishing glacial lakes where they spawn up on these shallow flats and they move hard off that first drop and sit on the outside grass line, or you're fishing more natural style lakes that have a ton of grass, a ton of wood, areas where these fish can really sit on and key on, very similar to some of those lakes down by Florida area. There's a ton of different variety and there's a ton of different options for you guys to go out and have success using this pattern. So those are my three main keys that I consider when I'm looking for post-spawn fish. But there are a couple of extra factors that you have to consider, especially if you live up here in the north. And the first one is when they spray the grass. A lot of times this time of year with the 4th of July coming up, the favorite thing for the Michigan DNR to do is spray all the grass, which is great for boaters. It's great for people that like to swim in the lake, but it's not good for the bass. The reason for that is when they spray the grass, most of the times they're using a product called copper sulfate. It's a very dense material that they spray into the water and it actually sinks down into the roots of the plant and it causes the plant to die from the roots. That kills it a long time. You're basically really killing the grass and causing it to die and deteriorate really quickly which is great for killing the grass, terrible for the bass. And what will happen a lot of times is once they spray the grass, these fish actually will suspend up in it. And that's where forward facing sonar or really line watching your bait is going to be super critical because a lot of times after they spray and you're flipping the same grass lines where you just had success, you're going to get a lot of bites on the fall, especially with a jig or a Texas rig. When those fish are suspended up and you flip in there after they've sprayed, you're gonna get a lot of your bites on the fall because these fish are gonna be suspended up. When they spray, the last thing these fish wanna do is get into the base of these plants and hang out at the base or eat stuff off the bottom where that copper sulfate is. So they're gonna lift up, they're gonna rise up off the bottom and that's where some of these baits are really gonna be a key factor. Another big consideration is if that grass gets killed or you don't have grass in your body of water, what you can look for is hard cover. Once that grass is gone, these fish are really gonna to have to push towards that hard cover. So stumps or rocks or some bottom composition change for these fish to sit on, that's where they're gonna to move to because without grass, they have to move to something. And that's the easiest, most obvious piece of cover for those fish to move to. So without grass, you're looking for hard cover, brush piles, man-made structures, rocks, stumps, boulders, something on the bottom different than grass, especially dying grass, for these fish to sit on. So what's the best way for me to find these pieces of cover to be fishing? My number one answer is going to be looking at the graph, finding it on side view or down imaging. The reason this is going to be important is because you're going to be able to use your graphs to really isolate or locate specific pieces of cover and structure. Another great tool is going to be Google Maps. 
Google Maps with the history view where you can take the water levels up and down, especially if you're in a place where they have big drawdowns, is going to be an invaluable tool. You get on there, you can draw your lake down, you can locate these ditches and drains with stumps and boulders on them, mark them on your Google Maps and transfer them to your units and have a lot of success that way. And finally, it's going to be fishing through these areas. And if you're lucky enough to have forward-facing sonar, to me, the post-spawn is one of the best times to be able to use this piece of technology. A lot of times these fish are going to be in specific pieces of cover, so having forward-facing sonar to set up on this correctly is really, really nice, but it's not a must-have. I get a lot of comments saying, man, the only reason you caught those fish is because you had forward-facing live scope. The only reason you caught them is because you knew how to set up on it. And while it does help you break down water a lot more quickly, you can do the same thing by looking at your graphs, looking at Google Maps, and spending a lot of time in the driver's seat to figure out where these fish are moving to and how to catch them. Now we're going to break down my four favorite setups for this style of fishing. And like I mentioned, one of my favorite is a jig, flipping it to these fish that are suspended. There's no better bite than when you're flipping a jig and they eat it on the fall and your line starts swimming to the side. So what I have here is a half ounce Arky head style jig in a magic craw color. When these fish are suspended up, they're going to be feeding on bait fish like bluegill and perch and the magic craw does a really good job of imitating those different styles of bait fish. The trailer on here, no surprise, is a 4-inch Berkeley Chigger Craw, and I really like this trailer because it has a good combination of a flapping action as well as sort of a dead, kind of just natural gliding action on the fall. As opposed to some trailers that cause a lot of drop and a lot of fall really hard, this just has that best combination that I've found to trigger these fish in a variety of different situations. The rod that I like to use when I'm flipping a jig when they're eating it on the fall is a little bit longer rod. This is a Tactical Elite TFO 756. It's a seven foot five heavy rod with a moderate action. The benefit of this is when that fish eats it on the fall, you're able to pick up that line quickly with the rod as well as with the reel and move the line quickly to set the hook when that fish eats that bait and is moving to you. The reel I'm using is a seven speed gear ratio. It's a seven three to one Abu Garcia Revo STX with 17 or 20 pound test. I recommend going with that little bit heavier line. For me, it's a personal preference, but I don't like to have to retie a ton. I'm fishing, you know, offshore cover, typically moderately clean water, but that 20 pound test fluorocarbon allows me to fish these fish and not have to worry about any breakoffs or issues. Another setup that I'm gonna be using is a Texas rig style bait. Now I have another jig rigged up here and there's a reason for that that I want to show you guys. This here is a compact style jig. As opposed to the other, which is more of your standard bulkier profile, the compact jig is going to fall faster. I am a half ounce jig fisherman through and through and through. I don't pick up another style or size of jig. The half ounce is really my favorite. What I'm going to modify on these baits to cause them to act different in the water is the trailer and the size of the jig. A compact half ounce jig is gonna fall like a three quarter or five eighths in the water because it's a little bit smaller profile. So by going to a compact style jig, a little bit smaller body, lighter skirt, it's gonna fall faster and that's what I'm gonna be able to use when I'm looking for a really fast reaction style bite. This bigger bulkier profile jig with a bigger trailer, that's what I'm gonna use when I'm looking for that fish to follow it down on a slower fall or grab that bait off the bottom, a bigger profile. So when I'm Texas rigging these fish, when I'm flipping a creature style bait, I like a bait with a lot of action with a big bulky profile that's gonna move a lot of water. So here in my left hand, this is a Berkeley Power Hog and this is a Zoom Brush Hog. This is probably one of the most legendary creature style baits on the market. But I like to go to these bigger, bulkier style baits because they move a lot of water. It's a big presentation and these twister tails kind of undulate and move a lot of water on the fall. I'm looking for something to get these bass's attention, but also do a good job of imitating the bait fish in the area. And a lot of times they're getting to that bigger size. And so by going to a bait like the power hog or a brush hog or some sort of bigger creature style flipping bait when I'm flipping offshore grass or cover, I'm gonna get those bigger than average bites. The weight that I like to use is really gonna be dependent, but most of the time it's a 3 16 to a 3 8 ounce flipping style tungsten weight. I like the tungsten because if I'm dragging that bait on the bottom, I can really feel everything there is. There's just so many benefits of tungsten. It's a little bit smaller profile that the tungsten for me is gonna get the nod over traditional lead. But if that's all you can afford, I'm looking for a 3 16 to a 3 8 ounce style weight. That's where I find the sweet spot to be. And then I'm fishing on a 4 rot EWG style flipping hook 
This next bait's a little bit more specialty, but there is a really, really important time and place for this, and this is when they're spraying the grass. When they spray the grass, a jerk bait is gonna get my nod. Now, obviously, with Panoptics Live Scope, a jerk bait's gonna be a really, really powerful tool, but when they're spraying the grass and these fish start to suspend up in it, using a jerk bait can be a great tool to trigger these fish that are up in the grass looking upwards. This is a brand new Berkley Stun of 112 in a perch color. Um, you can vary your color based on the type of forage or bait fish they're feeding on, but this is just a really, really good color all around for largemouth and smallmouth. So using a jerk bait is a really effective tool when they've sprayed the grass and those fish are starting to suspend up. Or if you're fishing a little bit shallower areas where those fish are transitioning through, a jerk bait can be a great tool for that as well. The rod I'm throwing this on is a TFO Tactical Elite seven foot cranking rod. It's a softer style rod that bends deeper into the blank so it helps me keep, keep these fish pinned when they bite the jerk bait. 10 pound test fluorocarbon line and then a high speed 80 to one gear ratio Revo ALF reel. And finally, if I have to go to ferry line, if I have to pick up the spinning rod, I'm picking up a seven inch Nico worm. This is the Berkeley Magnum hit worm and this is kind of a sleeper but the Nico worm did so much work for me last year. The reason this bait works so effectively is you can fish it on the bottom, but it also falls similarly to a wacky rig where it has that shimmy or movement on the fall. So it's a really effective technique. And as opposed to a wacky rig, with the 332nd ounce weight in the head, the bait's going to fall nose down and kind of have a glide to it. So you're going to get just as many bites on the fall as you are dragging this thing on the bottom, fishing it slowly along the bottom. And then 8 pound test fluorocarbon to 10 pound test braided line. Abu Garcia Zeta 20 size reel and the rod that I'm throwing this on is a TFO Tactical Bass 713. It's a 71 medium light rod which borders on the medium with a little bit softer tip. So that's really my go-to during the post spawn. That's how I break it down. Find yourself the highways these bass are going to be traveling. Find yourself the cover that they're going to set up on and find the bait fish that these fish are feeding on and that's going to be your keys to success for post spawn and early summer bass. If you guys have any questions or comments please do me a huge favor hit me up down in the comment section below i'll respond to each and every one of you guys and help you have success on your home body's water as always thank you guys for watching all this product's going to be linked down in the description below thank you guys so much have a great day take care tight lines god bless pursue passion